Well, thank you. I appreciate the music this morning, and uh, it definitely sets the tone for uh, the message this morning, certainly as we are in the Word of God today, uh, talking this morning about the truth of God. And we are in a study, as you know, dealing with the attributes of God. Well, if you've ever been on a boat, you know that one of the most important uh, instruments on the boat is the compass. The compass is very, very important, although I would say that it's less important today because, after all, today everything's electronic and you have GPSs. But GPSs can tell lies, can't they? Uh, recently I was driving along and I pointed to the GPS in the truck and I said to Karen, I said, look at that, we're in a lake right now <laughs> as we're driving down this road. GPSs don't always get it straight. Most important uh, instrument that I used to, to put on my boat when I would buy a boat would be a Ritchie compass. Always got a Ritchie compass. Why? I don't know. I think that was the sporting goods store where my dad worked part-time and that's where I got it. But it was very important that the compass be in a place where you could see it because back in those days you didn't have GPSs and you set a course. We always had charts around the house and we would be able to, to take measurements and we would say it's this many you know, miles and it's this heading and we want to make sure that we're watching very closely that compass so that we make sure that we go the direction that we needed to go. There were a couple of times when I wasn't as diligent watching the compass. And over a period of miles, I found myself to be miles off. Uh, having that compass is absolutely significant. They even have people who will come on board the larger boats and they will do a survey of the compass and they will determine whether or not the compass is truly accurate. You see, every boat is different and all of those metal pieces, because it was a magnetic compass, uh, would be pulled or drawn to different areas in the boat. And so you had to have it calibrated perfectly so that you knew when you were out on the high seas that you were following explicitly the direction that you needed to go. And if your compass said, this is north, and it really was not north, it could create enormous problems for you. And as you know, there's a north, there's a magnetic north, and you need to know and understand all of those things if you're out there on the high seas. Well, it's amazing, but with all the technology today, we still have shipwrecks, don't we? Uh, we have times where people get close to things they shouldn't be close to. Uh, not too long ago, uh, maybe four or five months ago, uh, the ferry boat that goes out of Hyannis, Massachusetts over to Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket uh, piled into the, the jetty, the breakwater, because the captain of the boat thought that that was a channel marker, and it wasn't a channel marker. It turned out to be the end of the breakers and the, the stone wall that's there, the rocks. He brought it right up on the rocks, and it was months in getting it repaired. Why? He didn't have... A compass. You see, he was going by something else and he was misunderstood. You and I find ourselves living in a day and age when there is much misunderstanding. And whether we realize it or not, there is a lot of fake news out there. Now, I'm not talking about this latest craze of talking about fake news, but I'm talking about theologically fake news. I'm talking about things that have gone on for quite a period of time now, and we find ourselves awash in those things in our society which really are not reflections of what truth is. As we have stopped to study the attributes of God, one very important point to keep in mind is that God is that standard. He is that straight edge. He is the ruler of all of these things. In fact, his holiness is the source whereby we can have any holiness in this world. His righteousness is the epitome of justice, and we wouldn't have justice without having him be just. And so everything comes off of the center, and the center is God himself. This is no different than any of the other attributes when you come to the attribute of truth. You see, God alone is truth. He is the source of all truth. And you and I live in a time, as I mentioned, where truth is quite relative. But with God, it's not relative, it's absolute. 
Let's look to the Lord in prayer this morning and ask him to bless his word, ask him to speak to our hearts today as we examine this important subject. Father, we come to you this morning so richly blessed by you in so many ways. Lord, there is no one like you. We have studied your holiness and your your justness and your goodness, your power. All of these things, Father, point to the greatness of our God, and we so respect and are in awe of you. But help us, Lord, this morning as we tackle the subject of truth to understand how you are the embodiment of truth. Help us, Father, to understand the significance behind holding truth in high esteem so that we're not misled. Father, I thank you for your word. May you teach it to our hearts and lives this morning. I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. The truth is you and I have in our possession the word of God, which is the source of that truth here on the earth. And I'd ask you this morning, turn in your Bibles to the passage in John chapter 18. John chapter 18. In John 18, we have the classic uh, scenario where we have Pilate bringing Jesus before him. And as Jesus comes before him, there is a dialogue uh, that ensues. And it starts there in verse 28. They led Jesus from Caliphas into the praetorium, and it was early, and they themselves did not enter into the praetorium so that they would not be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. And Pilate went out to them and said, what accusations do you bring against this man? And they answered and said to him, if this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. So Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews said to him, we're not permitted to put anyone to death to fulfill the word of Jesus, which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. Therefore, Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? Well, Pilate answered, he said, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore, Pilate said to him, so you are a king. And Jesus said, you say correctly that I'm a king. For this I have been born And for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And what did Pilate say to him? Pilate said to him, what exactly is truth? We've been asking that question in society for hundreds of years. Pilate is going to come to Jesus and he's going to say, Jesus, what is the truth here? What does all of this mean? And Jesus would explain to him that you've said correctly that I truly am a king. I am the king, and for this I have been born. I've come into the world, and Jesus says, I've come into the world to testify of the truth. And Pilate's question really begs the issue for us today What exactly is truth? Now, Jesus makes a statement there that those who know me know the truth. And the world that doesn't know me really doesn't know or understand the truth. And so, as Pilate has asked this question, he now comes to the point where he seems to want to know the truth, but you'll notice there that he doesn't ask Jesus exactly what is the truth. He says, what is truth? And he kind of, in a, in a haphazard way, um, kind of cynical, what is truth? Like truth cannot really be known. Remember, Pilate is in a situation where he is seeking to make a judgment He has to decide about the life of Jesus. The Jews on the one hand are saying that Jesus is a criminal, that he is worthy of death. And 
For Pilate, Pilate now has to make a judgment on that. Jesus is obvious to Pilate as someone who's really not a threat. And Pilate's comment to Jesus, what is truth, implies the idea that Pilate really couldn't know whether or not it was lawful, legal, and the right, just thing to do to put Jesus to death. And so he throws his hands up in the air and says, what is truth? Now, truth for Pilate was whatever one wished to believe. It's whatever you decide to believe that is true. Jesus believed he was a king. The scribes, the Pharisees, claimed he was a fraud, a traitor, a menace to Judaism, to Rome even. And so Pilate doubts that the truth really can be known. Now, as Pilate asks this question, uh, there's some key points that come into focus for us today. We wish that Pilate, in in his idea of the truth, was alone in this, but he's not. In fact, what we find is it's farther and farther from abnormal. So we fast forward to our society today all the way from Pilate's time, and we acknowledge that the same view that Pilate had, what is truth, can we really know the truth, is predominant in our society. It is the viewpoint of our society today. That is, Absolute truth cannot be known. Our society is saying, listen to it, that there is no truth that can be understood by us today. And every single one of us then has his own truth. And this is the the malaise that we live in today, isn't it? Uh, where your truth is, is one thing and no one can deny you of your truth and my truth is my truth and uh, we're kind of, um, as Schaefer said, firmly planted in midair. We really don't have an anchor. And so as we live life and we're trying to, to put all of these things into perspective, we have to ask ourselves the question, is this God how you want me to live? God, do you want me to live in a world where I really don't know what is truth? Or do you expect me to indeed know the truth? And Jesus' words to Pilate are absolutely significant when he says, those who hear my voice, those who know me, will know the truth. And I believe as followers of Christ, God expects us to know the truth. There are many things out in the world today that want to deceive us, isn't there? And that's why Galatians 6, 7 is so relative today. Uh, You know, be not deceived, Paul writes. The problem is you and I can be easily deceived. This world today is seeking to deceive us, and it's not just out there, the the, the liberal thought. It's not just uh, the, the ideas that are being floated about in universities. It's not just there. But this idea that we cannot know truth has even permeated Christianity. And it is so much so the opposite of what Jesus was saying when he says, well, wait a minute. He says, for this I've come into the world to testify to the truth. And then he makes a statement, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. I recognize you, Lord. I'm listening. I hear what you have to say. And part of the reason, as we're going to see, this is a spiritual exercise for the followers of Jesus Christ. There are many books that have been written in recent years about the whole aspect of change when it comes to the truth in our society and even in Christianity. Uh, One book is called Relativism. Uh, this is a book by Beckworth and, and Kuhl, or Kukul, and uh, it's interesting. That's just one book. If you've ever read uh, any of David Wells' books, I would really encourage you to pick up some of his books. Uh, no, no Place for Truth, Dining with the Devil. Uh, those books are very much uh, pinpointing what is wrong with the thinking today among not only the world and our society, but also Christianity, some of these things that are, are happening. Oz Guinness is another one. If you don't have any of Oz Guinness's books or you haven't read any of his books, 
uh, spend the time, go on Amazon or whatever you, wherever you shop and, and pick up some of Oz Guinness's books. These are, these are excellent, excellent resources. And they've been pointing this out now for decades because this shift that's been going on has been over time uh, not so subtle. And so uh, a fellow by the name of Scott Horton uh, writes the, the book, Made in America, The Shaping of Modern American Evangelicalisms. And he writes and he says, he reminds us that the secular world has come to trust more in science than in the scriptures when it tries to discern the truth. Uh, but science can never fulfill the task of answering the big, deep questions of life. And this is where it falls uh, flat. Notice, um, let me find this. Here it is. Uh, uh, John Eccles, a Nobel Prize winning pioneer in brain research. He observes science in trying to answer questions beyond, co- beyond its competence really becomes reduced to uh, a superstition. Science, he says, cannot explain the existence of each of us as unique self. Nor could it answer such fundamental questions as, who am I? Why am I here? How did I come to be at a certain place in time? What happens after death? You see, these are questions that science cannot answer. Uh, They're mysteries that go well beyond uh, science and are not uh, able to be apprehended. With the Enlightenment, science replaced Christianity as the intellectual authority. But when science failed, to provide ultimate answers itself, relativism replaced science. And so we live in a time where relativism uh, is the norm. It has become the norm. Uh, It's amazing even in places of education, even in Christian education, uh, we have come to the point where relativism has been normalized. Uh, The purpose of education, Bloom says, if you've ever read the book, The Closing of the American Mind by Bloom, it's an excellent book. It's a hard read, but it's an excellent book. Uh, It's it's small print, it's thick, been out about 15 years or more now uh, at this point. But he was spot on when he wrote about this. He says uh, that uh, as you're thinking of scholarship, he says it's not, uh, the education today is not to make scholars, but to provide them with a moral virtue. Openness is what that moral virtue is. There's one thing a professor can be absolutely certain of, according to Bloom, almost every student entering the university believes or says he believes that truth is relative. Uh, Young people today are growing up and they don't see an absolute truth. Students have causes without content, reasons replaced by mindless commitment, consciousness raising and trashy sentimentality. Can we not say the same of contemporary evangelical subculture? And he's absolutely true. Uh, In many, many ways, we see that there is no truth here. And that should be the sign that is put up over many universities uh, here in our great country. It's a culture of narcissism where we're self-focused. And in that culture, truth is really given way to credibility. Uh, And we see that within the style of, of life that people are grabbing a hold of. You know, I mentioned back in probably the 1980s, when I first was preaching, I said, you know, Christianity is interesting because I'm running into people who don't regard the word of God as absolute. In fact, what people would normally do is they would grab certain things in the scriptures that they liked and they would leave the other things that they didn't like. Now, if you've ever gone through a cafeteria line where you pay at the end, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You go through and you see the, the things that you like. You don't normally put green beans, broccoli, and asparagus on your plate. If you were me, I would normally go through the line, always got a milkshake, always got Twinkies, and maybe a hamburger if they had one. And that was the extent of it. French fries was always a given as well. And so it was all, all that health food, you know what I mean? Uh, there are things that I would take, there were things that I would leave. Well, within Christianity, it's very much the same. It's a cafeteria-style Christianity. I remember saying that, like I said, back in the 80s, I was saying that, and it really has morphed into that reality as relativism has come to play a bigger and bigger part. And so we look at it and we say, as we see life and we see things unfold, 
things are not going uh, in the right direction. Uh, Francis Schaeffer noted, he talks about Huxley in a quote that he had. He said, he spoke as a prophet when he said, there would come a day when faith would be separated from all fact and faith would go on triumphant forever. After all, this is what Kant and uh, Kierkegaard acted out with this famous leaf of faith uh, many years ago. And Schaefer cautioned, he says, not only the liberal theologians are doing this, but also the evangelical orthodox theologians who begin to tone down the truth, the propositional truth of scriptures which God has given to us. The majority of evangelical and seminary students, more than half, according to James Hunter, believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, not mistaken in its teachings, but it's not always to be taken literally in its statements concerning matters of science and historical reporting. So as soon as you do that, the word of God takes on different meaning. It's not so absolute anymore. It's not so trustworthy. My friends, I would have an enormous problem with that. If that is what our Bible college students and our seminary students are coming to the seats of higher learning with that presupposition, uh, that would drive me crazy. I've always believed that the Bible is the word of God without apology. I've always believed in the verbal plenary inspiration. That is, the very words of Scripture are inspired. And not only the words, but the entirety of it. It is all inspired. And so I dedicated my time and study to know and understand what the word of God says. Because it is absolutely trustworthy. Now can you imagine the mindset, and maybe you can, but I'm old, so I can't. <laughs> But you come to the scriptures and you say to yourself, well, it's, it's true here, but over here it's not. I, I trust it for this, but you know, there really couldn't be a fish that big that would swallow a man. There really couldn't be a flood that was universal, maybe more local or geographically regional. Listen, my friends, this word of God has got to be either true or false, it is tied from Genesis 1-1 all the way through the scriptures to the end in Revelation. And Revelation gives an, a warning and it says, woe to the guy who takes anything away or adds anything to this book. And we are finding ourselves living in a time where things are being taken away. What do you do with a literal creation? well, we'll come up with an idea called theistic evolution. We'll create theories that explain it one way when it's another. What do you do with areas of morality? How do you dress those areas of morality that are not popular in your society? Well, you try to figure out a way to accommodate it, and so you, you find that, well, since there's no absolute truth, and certain things in the scriptures could be wrong, maybe these things have not been addressed fairly either. You see, we have to be very careful as we approach the word of God. The word of God is not like other things. The word of God is, is true. And we give ourselves to following it regardless of what our society says. One of the things that I was teaching when I was in Asia on that course of hermeneutics, one of the big questions is authorial intent. When an author writes something, how hung up should we get about the author's intent? Uh, because the author's intent uh, may be very, very different from how we perceive what we're reading or watching. Uh, we may be thinking about um, the Beatles song. Uh, I get by with a little help from my friends. Thank you. Sounds like a nice song, and you're so thankful for your friends, aren't you? I mean, we love our friends. What would we do without our friends? But you know that Lennon, when he wrote the song, friends are drugs in his estimation. I get by with a little help from my friends. I get high with a little help from my friends. And somebody says, really? I didn't know that that was the intention of that song. Well, does that change that for you? Does it change it? You say, well, that's it. It's off my playlist because I didn't know it was about drugs. 
Well, the same thing's true about strawberry fields forever. And you know, I love strawberries. But it's a song about drugs. The Wizard of Oz, great horror movie. I watched it when I was seven years old, scared the absolute daylights out of me. Flying monkeys, I am still afraid of flying monkeys. But many people don't realize that the intention of that song had absolutely nothing to do with horror or adventure. It actually came from a novel that was written, and it had everything to do with the battle that was being raged in the United States over going off of the gold standard. You say, what? Remember the Wicked Witch of the West? Yes, that was the establishment on the western coast, the eastern. The other witch was the establishment on the east coast. And guess where Dorothy comes from? Kansas. Heartland is going to save America. Remember the the, the yellow brick road, you know, it's just gold all the way up. And do you know those ruby slippers that the witch had originally in the novel that was not ruby, it was a silver slipper. But because it was coming out on color TV, they thought, let's make it ruby instead. I hope I've not wrecked that movie for you. You see, what is in question here is what is important, the author's intent or your ability to interpret it like you want to interpret it. And so you'll go home after church singing loudly, I get by with a little help from my friends. Because you think of your wonderful friends from high school and college, your neighbor friends, your girlfriends, your your guy friends that you, on and on. But what is the importance of authorial intent? You may have the latitude to enjoy Wizard of Oz without thinking about whether or not the United States should go off of the gold standard. But let me ask you, do you have the liberty to reinterpret the Bible? You see, its author is different than the songwriter or the one who wrote the novel. Its author is God. And the only thing that matters is what God meant when he wrote those words. What is his intention? What does he want me to know? What does he want you to know about that passage of scripture? How important is it that we are able to get a grasp of the truth of God's word? If you've ever been around a compass that gets near something that's metal, what you'll find is the compass spins around. I remember being up in the Adirondacks and it started to snow, a wet, heavy snow, and every leaf was fully engaged with snow. I couldn't tell which way was out. I was hunting and I had my gun in one hand and my compass in the other and I watched as that barrel created a problem and it went round and round and round and I thought, I'm never going to get out of these woods. It was a good thing that I realized I was lost by 7 a.m. and it took me all day to get out. I finally realized that I needed to lean the gun against a tree someplace else and get some 20 feet away from it so that I could actually find out what in the world direction I'm supposed to go. The word of God is like that. It's the one source of direction. It's the direction that you and I need to follow. And we need to know what the author's intent was so that we can follow it. Would you agree? You see, this is so important to us. God says, I want you to listen to my word. Take your Bible and go with me over to Deuteronomy chapter 18, if you would. Deuteronomy 18 talks here about the importance of hearing God, listening to God. In Deuteronomy 18... He says, when you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable things of those nations. So you're going to go into a a new land. It's Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. He says, there shall not be found among you anyone who does these things that these people do. And he talks a little bit about that. 
In verse 14, he says, For those nations which you shall dispossess, listen to those who practice witchcraft and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do so. The Lord will raise up a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen, and you will listen to him. He goes on and he says in verse 19, it shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will acquire it of him. What does God want us to do? Well, God wants us very simply to listen to his words so that our compass isn't going around in circles. We have to have something to be able to lean on. And relativism is not it. Relativism has many, many flaws. But the one thing that is true here is that Jesus alone is solid and we can put our faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except it be through me. Who will you and I listen to is the enormous question. God's people go into the promised land and God is very concerned that they would start to listen to the people of the land and start to follow in their footsteps. And he says, I don't want you to do that. I want you to be able to do those things which are going to be according to my will. Noticing here back in Deuteronomy chapter 18, he says, you may say in your heart, How will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that's the thing which the Lord has not spoken. And so God says to them, listen, when you're there in the land, you might have questions. He says this through Moses. They might have questions at times. Is this the truth or is this the truth? And God says, this is how you'll know. If someone is prophesying in my name, the thing which they're prophesying will come true. And if not, don't believe them. It's pretty simple, isn't it? So let me ask you the question today. You're following Jesus Christ. You've placed your faith in him. And people are coming up and they're asking you questions about God. And they're trying to to put you in a box. Romans chapter 8 and verse 16 says that the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we really are children of God. If you go back to John chapter 18, verse 37, it says, everyone who is of the truth, everyone who's of the truth, hears my voice. How do I hear God's voice as a follower of Jesus Christ? God has not left his children on their own, but the spirit of God dwelling within us produces for us a witness with our spirit so that the two are linked together. And I now hear the truth of Jesus' voice. Isn't that wonderful to know? We're not adrift. Our compass isn't going around in circles. You're following God's word. Be committed to following God's word. And know that you're going to be different from society. Because a non-believer, someone who has not placed their faith in Jesus Christ, is not going to have the Spirit of God dwelling within them. They're not going to be hearing the voice of Jesus. They're much more apt to be like Pilate and say, what is truth? But you, as followers of Jesus Christ, know this, that the truth of God dwells in you. Jesus would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except they come through me. My friends, Jesus is the answer. He is the one who we've placed faith in. And because of that, we hear his voice, the spirit of God dwelling in us. And you'll know the truth, the Bible says, and the truth shall set you free. It'll make you free. You're free to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. His words are real. His words are true. There is no truth in our society apart from God. We need to know and understand that because he is that straight edge and his word has been given to us so that we can follow it 
and know that we are on the right path. My friends, listen. As followers of Christ, we need to help the society in which we live know the truth. We need to take the word of God to the people around us. We need to give the Lord Jesus Christ and the plan of salvation to people so that they can hear it for themselves and hopefully place their faith in Jesus Christ. My friend, there are so many people that are asking, you know, what is true? And it must be so frustrating. It must be so discouraging to walk around and not know what is the purpose of life? What do I do in an age of relativism? Do you realize that one of the fatal flaws of relativism is the fact that you can't even morally improve yourself? It's impossible because there's no absolutes. In this world where, where people have, have no anchor, immorality is abounding, and we're seeing it all over the place. The depth of depravity in our own country with this mindset is truly driving us in a direction that's away from God. And yet people are still not happy, even awash with all of the pleasures of this life. People still want to know the truth. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ did. He came and he brought to us the truth. We need to go from here and share it with others. We need to take the word of God to those who so desperately need to hear it. May God use us for his honor and glory. Let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, we come and we thank you for truly Jesus Christ is the answer to these huge questions. We know that Jesus is truly the rightful king. He is truly the savior of the world. How we thank you, Father, for the reality that the spirit of God bears witness of the truth as the Spirit of God dwells within us. And as such, Father, we hear the voice of the Master. The Spirit of God directs us away from sin. May the Spirit of God do a mighty work in all of our hearts. May we listen to the Holy Spirit of God. May we follow the Word of God and the leading of the Spirit, that we might be pleasing to you as we live this life. Help us, Father, with all the struggles that we see around us and all of the pitfalls that society is facing. Help us, Lord, to be different. Help us, Father, to have answers where the world finds themselves seeking the truth. May we provide that, Lord, for our neighbors and our friends. Help us, Lord, to be used of you in a special way during these days that we find ourselves living in. God, work in our hearts, I pray, in Jesus' wonderful name, amen. If you take your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter.